Well, good morning, friends, and welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. I'm Pastor Paul. Great to have you with us today uh, as we continue in our series uh, simply entitled, The Ancients Were Commended. It's a line that comes out of Hebrews chapter 11, reminding us uh, where we're reminded that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so we have been looking into uh, some of the, the greats, if you will, of the faith, but with the emphasis that God is the hero in every one of these stories. I mean, we see these heroic men and women, but, but in every one, we're reminded that whatever the battle is that they're up against, the battle is the Lord's. And so, uh, so today we're going to be in Judges, chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there as we take a look at the life of Samson. You're uh, perhaps quite familiar with the story. Uh, you know, we're mindful of Samson and Delilah. Maybe you're not quite so aware of the other women that were involved in his life. Uh, Samson was not a perfect man. He was not a perfect man. And yet he was a man whom God raised up and called out uh, for service. So a lot of lessons we can learn. So buckle up. We're going to uh, dive into the life of Samson here in just a moment. Before we do that, though, let's pray. Father God, as we gather together, uh, Lord, uh, even in this format, Lord, while, while some of us are here and some of us are there, and uh, Lord, we're just grateful that we can gather together around your word. We pray, Father, that your gracious Holy Spirit would bring our hearts to life in the hearing of your word. And we pray, God, that truly we would not be hearers only, but that, would, that we would be doers of it. And so, um, so may it be, Father, uh, use these truths, we pray, to shape us, to fashion us, to prune us, to well, to teach us, of course, uh, but God, to transform us, uh, we pray. May this not simply be a mental exercise, Lord, but, uh, but might it be a time when we humble ourselves before you and you do the work that you desire in us so that you can do all that you would through our lives. We pray in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So if you have, uh, if you've got your Bible, again, we're going to be in Judges 13 through 16. Um, just real quickly, I want to give you an update. So last week, we took a look at the life of Joshua. And so, you know, as we had jumped, uh, we, we leaped ahead from the crossing of the Red Sea to, uh, with Moses to Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. So today... We're taking a leap, uh, if you will, from Joshua up to, um, up to one of the judges, uh, one in a line of many judges who God called up. So, uh, <clears throat> so once again, just to, to catch you up to speed. So what do we know now? Well, now, when we get into the book of Judges, get into the book of Judges, Joshua is dead. A whole generation has died out. Well, we can read this in Judges chapter 1. So a generation died out, Joshua is dead, this new generation arose that's described in chapter 2, verse 10. There is this new generation that arose who, and I'm quoting this, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They didn't know him, they didn't know what he had done, which, which by the way, doesn't that remind us of how important it is to declare the praises of the one who brought us out. It, it's a good reminder for us then to make sure, let the world know the work that God has done, uh, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing. It's, it's so vital for us because with this generation that it speaks about in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says they didn't know the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Uh, they... They chased after uh, foreign gods there. And as their generation, or excuse me, as that generation's disobedience and rebellion grew, so did the anger of the Lord against them. And so God delivered them into the hands of nations who would plunder them. Um, 
which, by the way, just recently had someone ask me, so, uh, so can you help me understand why do bad things happen? Well, here's one of the reasons to why bad things happen in our lives. Here are the people of God being plundered by godless nations because of their rebellion, because of their disobedience. They were living in sin, and God brought hardship into their lives. He intentionally handed them over to nations that would plunder them, okay? And so, just one of the reasons why bad things happen. Uh, that's not the entire answer, but, uh, but just wanted to point that out. So, uh, so in time, God would send the judge to deliver his people, uh, the people of the covenant, because he remembered the covenant that he had made with them, um, that he was looking for their good, but, but in the process, uh, he couldn't wink at their rebellion, couldn't wink at their disobedience, uh, which is always interesting to me, by the way, because if this is how God treated his chosen, uh, the, the people of the covenant, then, you know, I have to wonder sometimes, I, I, I see people who look at this great land in which we live and believe that we are somehow untouchable because, well, we're America and we were founded on certain principles and things like that, so, so we are just an untouchable bunch. Uh, that is so not true. Look what God did with his own people. Anyway, so, uh, so the people were suffering. They would cry out to God. In time, God would send judges to deliver them. And, um, and Samson was one who God raised up after 40 years of Philistine oppression. Okay, so the Philistines had oppressed the people of God for 40 years and, and uh, God raised up a judge to deliver. So, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. So he raised up a judge to deliver. Uh, now note the, grace, the, note the grace and the mercy that is displayed here throughout the cycle because you can read through the book of Judges um, and, and it's a very familiar pattern, very familiar pattern. Uh, there would be times of, of ease, and individuals would take their eyes off of God. They would, they would get caught up in sin. Um, God would bring punishment upon them. Their hearts would be, you know, well, they would cry out to God in this punishment. Uh, in the, uh, you know, in the oppression, they would cry out to God, God would have mercy and grace upon them, and he would send a judge to deliver them, and, and in time, uh, while they were living in ease, which is another reason why, by the way, um, you know, in, in that there is something about pain in our lives that, that pushes us to cry out to God, that, that refines our thoughts and our attitude that drives us to him, uh, the, the fountain of life, right? And so perhaps another reason why we could say, no, you know what? I think that's why there is hardship allowed in our lives. It draws, draws us and drives us to God. Well, anyway, so we have all this mercy and, and grace uh, that we see poured out here um, I recall a time in my own life when I, when, when I distinguished in my own head the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this thing called mercy and grace. And then it's like, no, hold on. I mean, we see the mercy of God. We see the grace of God all through the Old Testament, um, as we do in, in the New. Well, anyway. So, uh, so this grace and mercy is just poured out all over this cycle of the judges, the people of God. He was shaping and refining uh, the people of God. Uh, when, when they deserved destruction, God sent them mercy and grace. He allowed them to suffer uh, to the point that they learned. It's like, hey, we can't do this on our own. And they cried out to God for deliverance. He allowed that. But then he would send the judge and say, all right, now deliver them. Deliver them from these evil ones. That's where we come to today's text. Uh, the judge that we're going to take a look at this morning is a judge named Samson. You're familiar with his story. 
not going to read every, uh, every line of Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16, uh, for which you can be grateful. But what we know at the start of Judges chapter 13, we know that again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So here we go again. And, and so what we see in Judges, there is this miraculous birth. Why would I say miraculous? I know that term gets thrown around a lot these days, but why would I say miraculous? Well, according to the scripture, the angel of the Lord, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ, came to Manoah's wife. Now, she was sterile and remained childless. Okay, she was sterile. And, and so this miraculous birth is foretold. Uh, when, when the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, said to her, you are going to conceive. You know, it just reminds us, Samson was known by God before he was born. Uh, Samson was created on purpose and with purpose. And it just reminds me of that passage that we have in Psalm 139. Do you remember that? In Psalm 139, where it, it tells us in, a, in one moment, verses 14 through 16, when, when David said, I praise you, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. For my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. And, and so we, we see the same kind of thing with the, the, the foretelling of the birth of Samson. It's going to be a miraculous birth because, again, uh, we, we have a woman who is barren. She's sterile. Uh, and she remains childless. And the angel of the Lord said, no, listen. Here you go, you are going to conceive. So the conception hadn't taken place yet because, well, the pre-incarnate Christ would have known that, but you are going to conceive. So it's a future event. It's a miraculous birth. It's foretold by the angel of the Lord. So that's the story. Remembering that, on the, the, again, Samson was created on purpose, he was created with purpose. Um, and it's, so I think it's important for us to remember that. If you were to go on, uh, read down through the, the first several verses there, and scripture says, now see to it, verse four, see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, that you don't do any, that you not, do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth. And he's going to begin the deliverance of Israel from the hand of the Philistines. He's going to begin the deliverance. And so, so what was this, uh, the Nazarite vow? Well, when you have a chance, look up Numbers chapter 6. Um, the first eight verses really give us the details about the Nazarite vow again. It is a vow of separation to the Lord. And, and, and it was no small thing. It was, a, it was a vow where no wine or other fermented drink was to be consumed. Uh, that, uh, that all the days of this vow, no razor would, uh, would be used on Samson's head. No contact with a dead body. Now, uh, some would look at uh, it. Some would look, and there is a lot of discussion about this. Some would look at uh, what we're going to see in a few moments, his contact with the lion, and we're going to be like, oh, well. Some look at this and say, well, right there, that's sin. He's violating his vow. That's, you know, that's contact with a dead body. Uh, I, I, I don't follow that opinion. I look back in Numbers chapter 6 where we first read about the Nazarite vow, and it sure seems that the... It sure seems that the, the context there is that of human bodies, not animal bodies. Well, but anyway, just so you know, there are those who would say, oh, no, he, he touched a dead lion. So look at this, you know, look at this violation of 
his vow. I don't see that as a violation of the vow, um, again, and I just, I base that on the context that we see in Numbers chapter 6. What we do know, uh, so the rest of chapter 13 talks about uh, Manoah and his wife, they're offering to the Lord, uh, there is a section in there, when <clears throat> Noah, uh, excuse me, Manoah, uh, when Manoah believes that the angel of the Lord is, a, is another human being, and so he offers him worship, and at that point, the angel of the Lord, because Manoah thought he was honoring a, a regular guy, the angel of the Lord uh, refused that. He said, no, listen, uh, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. If you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. And, and again, it says in verse 16 of chapter 13, Manoah didn't realize that it was the angel of the Lord. Uh, so he thought he was offering to a human being worship, and, and, uh, and the angel of the Lord said, no, no, no. Now, if you look at other places in Scripture, does the angel of the Lord receive worship? Yes. But not in this case. He's like, no, no, because Manoah didn't realize who he was dealing with. Well, so anyway, the end of chapter 13, the Lord blessed Samson. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And so again, we, we understand uh, from the miraculous, or from the foretelling to the miraculous birth to this distinct plan, and uh, now we know that God is blessing Samson. The Spirit of the Lord is stirring in him again. God's got a work for Samson to do. In chapter 14, Chapter 14, Samson sees and desires a Philistine woman. Now, the Pharisees, you may, or I'm sorry, the Philistines, you may recall, um, they were Israel's uncircumcised oppressors, right? So 40 years of oppression leading up to the time of, of uh, Samson's reign, 40 years of oppression, and Samson goes into, if you will, the camp of the enemy and says, I, I want her and I want you to get her for me as my wife, he told his mom and dad, who uh, said, there's got to be an acceptable woman amongst our people. Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Must you go there? You know, what came to my mind when I, when I read this, you know, so often we hear, ah, what the heart wants, what the heart wants, and, and, and so often we hear that as an excuse for all sorts of abominable behavior. We, we see that as the excuse for, um, you know, for individuals just, hey, listen, your heart wants it, you can't help what your heart wants. I mean, the heart wants what the heart wants, so... So go ahead, uh, not so fast. Recall that in, Philipp or in Proverbs, well, I'm having trouble today with my text. Um, recall that in Proverbs 14, 12, it says, because, you know, here in our text, uh, I have seen a Philistine woman, now get her for me as uh, for my wife. And when his parents objected, he said, oh, no, she's the right one for me. Proverbs 14, 12 reminds us that there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. And we're not going to see this as, <clears throat> we're not going to see this particular relationship necessarily uh, lead to Samson's death, but we do see Samson, uh, a man set apart for God, uh, to be wholly devoted to God. Now here he is, just making some really difficult choices. Remember chapter uh, 17, verse 9 in the book of Jeremiah reminds us that the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? And so I would really be careful in a world that says, oh, just follow your heart. I want to tell you what, your heart is stupid. Uh, your heart is, uh, it, it does not, always seek what is best for you. According to the scriptures, your heart is deceitful. It will chase after things that you ought not be chasing after. And so this nonsense about, well, just follow your heart. Um, you have to know, friends, there are warning bells all over that advice. 
And, and so if you find, if you find uh, an, an alleged Christian leader or even a Christian friend who just says, oh, just follow your heart. You need to shy away from that. You need to put some distance between that leader or that friend and yourself because that's horrible advice. The heart wants what the heart wants. That's, yeah. Well, listen, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, there is a way that seems right to man. In the end, it leads to death. And so we want to be very sensitive to those warnings. And so as we continue in chapter 14, it's where you're going to read about, uh, about a lion slain uh, sometime uh, later. You know, this lion came, and I it just, it, I find it intriguing, the language. And, you know, perhaps you haven't spent a lot of time uh, with, uh, with butchering. I, I haven't necessarily a lot, but enough experience that, that when this text says he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. <laughs> I just, I listened to that phrase and it's like, what in the world? So, so there's, there is work involved in tearing apart a young goat. I mean, so even in that, but there was this lion that was slain and, and he, he slew that lion with his bare hands, tore it apart, right? Which is pretty crazy. It helps us understand uh, the, the power that came upon Samson when the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, right? So again, it's not his own power. Uh, it wasn't a matter of, uh, because you might already be thinking, oh, but his hair is long here, so he can do that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but it clearly tells us, chapter 14, verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord came on him. And so this lion was slain. Then he goes on to, to check out this Philistine woman that he really liked. She is an eye catcher, apparently. And, um, and on his way back, when he went back to marry this woman, there in this carcass, uh, there was honey. Now, uh, so, so he took something sweet out of the, the eater, um, became a, a, a riddle. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And, and so that plays into this. There was honey in the carcass of the lion. He ate some, offered it to his parents, didn't tell them where it came from. Um, but, uh, but then he shared this riddle. Shared this riddle, and he shared it with the Philistines, the, uh, the bridegrooms, or excuse me, not the bridegrooms, but the companions of this Philistine woman. And so chapter 14 continues, and you've got this manipulative bride, verses 16 and 17, she, was, she just kept trying to get the secret of the riddle so that she could tell it to, uh, to her, uh, her friends, to her family members. You know that whole blood runs thicker than water? Yeah, something would have been good for Samson to remember. And so verse 16, she is so manipulative, this woman, uh, not, a, not a nice woman. Uh, she threw herself on Samson um, and says, you hate me, you don't really love me, you've given my people a riddle, but you haven't even told me the answer. He's like, I never even told my folks. So why should I explain it to you? And she cried the whole seven days of the wedding feast. The whole seven days of the wedding feast. On the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. And so she then explained the riddle to her people. Uh, so you have the lion slain, the honey in the carcass, the riddle that comes out of that, and then this manipulative bride. Uh, just a side note, if your beloved cannot be trusted, only a fool would meet that individual at the marriage altar. And so... Uh, so why in the world would someone go to the marriage altar? I realize you say, well, but I mean, this is, this is like during the feast, whatever. Uh, I, I get that. But it can serve as a warning to us. If your beloved can't be trusted, why in the world would you ever meet them at the altar? Pay attention to the character, to the nature of the individual that you are 
uh, that that you are falling in with, okay? It's just so important. Uh, and, and figure that out before you get to the altar. Uh, spend much time in prayer, much time getting to know that individual. Well, anyway, uh, so that's something that uh, that's really important for us as a side note here in chapter 14. Um, one other side note is simply this. Uh, referring to your wife as a heifer is going to negatively impact marital bliss, okay? <laughs> and so, because what am I talking about? Well, look at verse 18. When they, they guessed the answer to his riddle, well, they didn't guess, they had been told uh, by his manipulative wife. And, uh, and so when they got the answer right, he says, you know what, you wouldn't have known this if you haven't been plowing with my heifer. It's just a bad idea to refer to your wife as a heifer. Uh, so we have to move on. So what happens then? Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. Now remember, God is bringing judgment on the Philistines. God is delivering his people from... So we're going to read some things in here. It's like, wow, that doesn't seem very Christian. Well, God is using Samson as a deliverer. There's all sorts of things. By the way, when you see Samson do some boneheaded things, when you see him do some things, it's like, I don't think that's God honoring. I, it's important to remember that in Samson's life, as in others that we read about in the scriptures, just because you see something in the Bible doesn't mean it's biblical, right? Doesn't mean it's good and God-honoring. The, the scriptures include uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, in the story of redemption. And I'm glad that they do because my story isn't always pretty, nor is yours. Well, so God brings judgment, chapter 14, 19, and 20. Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. He went down, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of their belongings, gave their clothes to the ones that explained the riddle, which is kind of curious because he had promised suits of clothing to those who got, if anyone got the riddle right. Well, so, um, so, so those 30 men, uh, he had promised 30 suits of clothing, and so he slayed, he, he slayed 30 and gave their clothing. Well, anyhow, um, in the meantime, Samson's wife was given to the friend who had attended him at his wedding. Um, and so it just, this story, it's got a lot of ugly in it. I just, just want us to see. Chapter 15, Samson brings vengeance on, uh, on the Philistines. He destroys their crops uh, in an interesting tactic that really just helps us understand how anger can burn in a person. Uh, it would have been no easy task, the way that he went about destroying their crops. They ended up killing his wife and his father-in-law, uh, as a result, he slaughtered a whole bunch of Philistines. They came after him. The men of Judah actually bound him and handed him over to the Philistines. At that point, well, the Spirit of the Lord delivered Samson. Uh, as, uh, as, you know, so, so next in that, of course, there is this back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, Samson ends up slaying a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. And, and while he lay there, he cried out to God. He was very thirsty. He cried out to God in chapter 15. And he's like, wait, so I, I have slain these. You gave me victory. And now I'm, must I now die of thirst? God provided, miraculously provided water for Samson there. Now Samson, the, the scriptures tell us that, uh, that he ruled than for 20 years. Well, so we get into chapter 16. And, and so what happens in chapter 16? Well, uh, in the first few verses, we see Samson sleeping with a prostitute. It's like, what in the world? This man really needs to understand the wisdom that we find in Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs 6, it's where we read about, if you were to look down to verse 20, Keep your father's commands. Don't forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart forever. It talks about how important this is. Keep these things. And then he says, keep yourself from the immoral woman. I'm in verse 24. Keep, 
you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue and the wayward wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty. Don't let her captivate you with her eyes, for the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread. The adulteress preys upon your very life. And then listen, and, and men, I would especially encourage men, although it's, uh, it's, it's wise counsel for all. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? You know, that, that burning with passion, uh, that, that, uh, that illicit expression of, uh, of, of a legitimate desire, a legitimate need, but looking to fulfill that in illegitimate ways, uh, can a man scoop fire into his lap without being burned? And of course the answer is no. So uh, yet, even then, when they uh, planned to waylay Samson, God in his mercy and grace allowed him to escape, which just reminds us again the mercy and grace of God. By the way, just because God allowed Samson to escape when he had been with a prostitute, uh, should we conclude that, well, there you go, that must have been okay behavior. It absolutely was not. It's a testimony to the mercy and grace of God. God would never condone Hey, go find yourself a prostitute. And so, um, so we see the, the mercy and grace, the kindness of God. In chapter uh, 16, 4 through 22, we, we so enter Delilah again. Uh, this guy, this Samson, uh, devoted to God, but ends, I mean, dedicated to God. He's got this Nazarite vow. He makes one disastrous choice after another. Now, does God work through this? Absolutely. Is God directing him in sin? Absolutely not. James chapter 1, 13 through 15, reminds us that, that God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone to evil. And so we want to we wanna be very clear on that. But, and in Delilah, Delilah is commissioned by the Philistines to betray Samson. But God's not finished with Samson yet, and, and so we see his deliverance even there. Um, she, is, uh, she is wanting to know the secret of his great strength, and, and listen, what we find here, he is such a, uh, he, is, he is being played. Uh, it, shows the, it shows the allure, the enticement, uh, uh, the enticing power of a woman uh, and, 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 a, and a godless woman at that and she is just playing him and he is, he is just dumb enough to just follow suit, right? Sleeping with the enemy. I mean literally sleeping with the enemy and I would just encourage you I would encourage you if, uh, if, if you are exercising carelessness right now in your life, in your living, you've got to know, you've got to know that uh, as we're reminded in the book of Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. So, uh, so rather than walking in the light, Samson just continues to see, how close can I get to the edge here without falling off spiritually? How close can I get uh, and, and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a while without being consumed by it? Well, anyway, he's sleeping with the enemy. Um, she, um, verses uh, 15 of chapter 16, I mean, she just kept trying to get the truth. What's the secret of your strength? What's the secret of your strength? Tell me, tell me. And then finally, verse 15, chapter 16, she says, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? Uh, is that true? And I would say absolutely. Again, if you can't trust someone with everything that you have, why in the places would you ever meet them at the altar? Why would you ever meet them at the altar if you can't trust them with everything, right? But anyway... How can you say I love you when you don't confide in me? <clears throat> well, again, she's just trying to, uh, she's just trying to hook him. She is trying to betray him. Uh, and she is using her wiles to do that. But is there truth in, hey, 
So if I trust, I'm going to confide. If I trust you, if I love you, am I going to be honest with you in all things? Absolutely. But anyway, she's trying to trap him, which is another good uh, reminder for us about unequal yoking. Uh, you know, being a believer, being married to an unbeliever, a person of God being, uh, you know, a person of God who is in that regard has consecrated themselves to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Um, it's, a, it's another great case against unequal yoking. Uh, we look down at verse 16 uh, because she is just, she is uh, nagging, nagging, nagging. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. Uh, we can see in verse 16, nagging is exhausting, uh, effective perhaps, but it is so damaging to relationships. And so uh, better to live alone on the rooftop than with a quarrelsome nagging woman. Is that what, anyway, uh, so we find that in the book of Proverbs, but, uh, but nagging, it's exhausting. And he, uh, Samson, eventually just caved in, told her the secret. He says, well, listen, there's never been a razor used on my head. Because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. It's important for us to understand, by the way, uh, the strength wasn't in the hair. The strength was in the vow of consecration. And so, uh, so obedience to the vow, uh, faithfulness to the vow is what made him strong. But the vow included that you don't ever cut your hair. You drop down into verse 20. So Delilah saw that he had told her everything. And she, uh, again, she betrayed him to... Uh, to her uh, people, and that ended up then um, resulting in his capture. He, he woke up, and this is a super sad part of the story, he woke up when she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, and he woke up and thought, well, I'm just going to break myself free as I have before, uh, but here's what it says in verse 20, he didn't even know that the Lord had left him. Remember we talked last week about how God's not going to, with, to go with us in our wandering and going astray. Recall the story of the prodigal when God's, uh, the father rep, uh, repres, who represents God in the story, he's, he's still back on the farm. He's not going to go with the prodigal into his lostness. Oh, let me go celebrate with you. You can just live however you want to live, behave however you want to behave, and I'll be with you. That's absolutely not... Samson didn't even know that the Spirit of God left him. So hardened his heart had become, uh, so uh, uh, intoxicated by the things of the world, by the allure of the woman, he didn't even realize. He had gotten so used to, he just was taking God for granted and the power for granted. It's as if God was to be used as a, as a, as a, as a trick in a, in a sideshow, right? Anyway, he didn't even know. And, and we see in verses 21 and 22, he ends up having his eye, eyes gouged out. He is, in, he is shackled. He is in prison. His eyes are gouged out. But it says, oh, his hair is beginning to grow. And then verses 23 through the end, and, and with this we close, Samson's sin. Samson's sin, his rebellion, his uh, carelessness, led to great praise to a false god. You know, when you think about that, so I, don't want, I, I, I don't want my sin, I don't want my life, anything about my life to be something that's going to cause the unbeliever to worship a false god. I want my life to live always for the glory of the one true God. Well, so uh, Samson's uh, failure and failure and failure, uh, one after another, it leads to uh, much praise going to Dagon, the uh, god of the Philistines. Their celebration to Dagon, uh, though it ended in the death of Samson, you can see that in chapter 16. And he just, uh, he had been brought out uh, as, as a, a sideshow act, kind of a freak show. 
hey, look at this guy, you know, look at him. We're bringing him out here to make fun of him. They didn't realize that the Spirit of God had uh, returned in power on Samson. In brokenness, he cried out to God. And the Spirit of God enabled him then to destroy the pillars that were holding the, the roof where there was this great celebration. The scriptures tell us that uh, he pushed with all of his might, down came the temple on the rulers and all the people that were in it. And so then he killed many more with his death than he did with his life. Many more in his death than in his life. And so we find a tragic story. In many ways, uh, there, is, there is much brokenness in the story of Samson. His is not a story like Joseph where he could say, wow, look at that, one great choice after another. Wow, look at such steadfastness. But we do see God uh, pouring out much mercy and grace. We do see God using the successes and the failures of Samson to bring glory to his own name and to accomplish God's purposes. And so I would leave you simply with this, uh, this prayer that I think we, we see in the way that Samson's life ended in death but victory for the glory of God. I, I would leave you with this prayer. Almighty God, in my health or in my sickness, in my pain or in my pleasure, in my wealth or in my poverty, in my strength or in my weakness, in my life or in my death, be glorified. Amen. Father, I do thank you for the opportunity that we have to come uh, once again before your word. And God, I pray that you would just take us back to this text early and often. I pray, God, that, that we might, um, well, Lord, glean from it all the truths that you have for us, Lord, uh, with the warnings, with the teachings, with the word of encouragement, with the, the evidences of your faithfulness, with all of it. God, use it to shape and fashion us, we pray, for the glory of your great name. Amen. Well, thank you so much uh, for tuning in once again today. Great to have you with us. We're looking forward to seeing you in worship in person but for this moment sure glad that you can join us in the study of god's word love you like crazy